I want to title the message today, the New Testament. And um, I don't think just listening to the title, any of us can be really, any of us might really be aware of how significant this subject is because the, the term New Testament is so familiar to us. It, uh, when, when, when I use the word, what do you think about is a particular division of the Bible? You have the Old Testament and the New Testament. But what does it imply really? What does the term New Testament imply and why is it used at all? Well, I found an interesting verse not so long ago that I want to share with you or I want to remind you of. Go with me to Luke chapter 22 and I'd like us to read together verse 20. Luke chapter 22 and I'd like to read verse 20. Likewise also, let me read from verse 19 so you get the context. And he took bread and gave, unto, and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance for you. Rem I'm sorry. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Now I want to just put this on the board so we can focus on it. The New Testament. In my blood. Alright, two things there is that Jesus says it is new and he, 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 he says it is in my blood. What does that mean? I mean, frequently we... We take the communion service, right? We, we get together and we have a little bit of bread and we drink a little grape juice, wine, as the case may be. And we go through this ritual. But when Jesus in, instituted this ceremony, it was a very solemn occasion. And you can think of the disciples. Their senses were on a razor's edge. They recognized that this was a moment of, of great import. Jesus' solemnity, everything that he was doing was deeply significant. So he took the cup and he said, this is the New Testament in my blood. Well, you know, most Christians think, well, that little, that little glass of wine is a symbol of an arrangement that Jesus made. He made an arrangement, okay? And the arrangement is, well, you do this and he will do this. But you have to put everything in context. When Jesus says the New Testament, he was setting it in contrast to something called the Old Testament. Or the Old Covenant. He says, this is a New Testament. This is a new arrangement that I have with my people. It is all wrapped up in this symbol. And this symbol is in my what? It is in my blood. I've been trying to go back to look at some of these symbols and ask myself, what do they represent in reality? And, and if I ask you, what does blood represent? What would you say? Life. Amen. Everybody knows, blood represents life. What Jesus was saying was that this cup represents my life. And the essence of the new covenant that I will make with my people is what? My life. It's not about a red fluid. It's about life. Now I want to, co to contrast this with what existed before because he says, this is a new covenant and it's in my life. The old covenant apparently was not in his life. And you can't really appreciate the New Testament until you begin to contrast it with the Old Testament. That's why yesterday when somebody said, um, there is killing and so on in the Old Testament. In the Bible I said, that's not the New Testament. That's not Christianity. The Old Testament is not Christianity. It is not. I know we believe in the Old Testament is the word of God. True. Amen. But understand it properly. The Old Testament is not Christianity. And it is not the foundation of our religion. And it is not the basis of the life that we have. It is a shadow, a type, a representation that brings us to the New Testament. But our religion is the New Testament. Christ didn't come to, 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 to build, to, to repair the old or to, or to expand the old. He came to bring something that was different. 
And we can look at the verses this morning to, show, to, 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 to demonstrate that. But Jesus says, this is my, my blood. This is the New Testament in my blood. The New Testament, the New Covenant is essentially the life of Jesus Christ. I'm standing here this morning. What is the basis of my, of my words? What's the basis of my religion? What's the basis of my experience? Do I possess life? Do I possess life? Am I a New Testament person? I mean, that's a serious question for every one of us to ask ourselves. Am I a New Testament believer? Because the New Testament is essentially the blood or the life of Jesus Christ. In many ways, the religion of Christianity today is more like Judaism and Islam than it is like the Christianity of the New Testament. And I believe the reason is that we have not, we have not understood the implications of the reality, the, the reality that the New Testament is the blood or the life of Jesus Christ. We have adopted the same principle that religion has to do with moral behavior. It has to do with the formulation and the expression of doctrines. It has to do with the idea that my doctrines are better than your doctrines. I mean, when you go to witness what you set out, I mean, on the most basic level, most, most of us probably set out to prove to somebody that Sabbath is more important than Sunday. And we might extend it to, to, to um, eating herbs is better than meat. Right? And we go along that road of doctrine. And it's a focus of a lot of our, our religion. And even when we get down to, to subjects like the guarded, which are important, but still it becomes a question of whether you have a concept of one or you have a concept of three. But when I look at the Bible, I see that the essence of the New Testament religion is Christ in the believer. This is the only thing. This is the only thing that can ever make a difference in this world. And God's people have got to get that part right. Everything else is peripheral. Everything else springs from that great consequence of experiencing that life. It doesn't matter if you keep the Sabbath if you don't have Christ in you. Are you understand the truth about the garden? What does it matter? You go down to the grave and you go down to hell as the most enlightened person. <laughs> Jesus says the New Testament is in my blood. Look at Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9 and verse 15. No, I'm going to read from verse 15. It says, and for this cause, he, that is Jesus, he is the mediator of the New Testament. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. But there you see, we have said that Jesus is our mediator, Jesus is our intercessor. But here we are told clearly, Mediator of what? He's a mediator of the New Testament. In other words, what Jesus is doing in heaven today, what he has been doing for the past 2,000 years, is mediating only the New Testament. And what, what is the New Covenant again? It is the life of Jesus Christ. What he has been doing is imparting his life. That's what it means that he's a mediator, right? He has been imparting his life, and essentially, if you want to wrap up his ministry in one principle. This is it. He is the mediator of the New Testament. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 6. Now verse 6 is where I want us to read. It says, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament? Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Now, this, this verse probably more ably than any other verse that I can think of expresses the great difference between both the Old and the New, New Testament. First of all, it says that we are 
ministers. And here he's speaking to Christians. Women, children, men, we are ministers. And I suppose some of us are full-time ministers and some of us are part-time ministers. Some of us are incidental ministers, whatever, but we are ministers. But ministers of what? Ministers of what? It says we are ministers of the New Testament. Who is a minister? Caretakers, tenders of the people. Well, you have added a little bit of a 20th century meaning in there. But essentially a minister is just somebody who ministers. And a minister is somebody who serves, right? So somebody who is involved in the service relating to the New Testament is a minister of the New Testament. God has made us ministers of the New Testament. So therefore, when Paul, when Paul says we are ministers of the New Testament, he is, by, by omission, he's saying we are not ministers of what? Exactly, we are not ministers of the Old Testament. The, New, the Old Testament had its ministers, but I hope nobody here sees yourself as a minister of the Old Testament. But what exactly is the difference between both Testaments? Well, I want to emphasize this first of all. Jesus says he gave us the covenant of his life. The New Testament, the covenant in his blood. Then he himself is the mediator of the New Covenant, the New Testament. Then we are ministers of the New Testament. So, Jesus is the mediator of this testament. Jesus gives us this testament in his life. And we are ministers of this testament. In case you missed it the first time, three places the Bible witnesses, and many other places, but three places it is clearly insisted upon that our mission in this planet is to minister the New Covenant. And that new covenant, that new testament is what? The blood. the blood of Jesus, the life of Jesus. And so Paul says, in that same verse, he says, not of the letter. Because the letter does what? The letter kills. So it's not of the letter, but it is of the what? The spirit. Because the spirit gives life. Now there you see the difference a striking difference that is brought out here between both covenants. The essential difference is that one is of the letter and one is of the spirit. Now the way I understood this for many years, and I think many people still understand it this way, even among us, I understood it to mean that, alright, the letter is what is stated point by point. Like, for example, you shall not kill. But the spirit is the essential principle behind that statement. You shall not think of killing. That's how I always understood it. And like I say, most people understand it this way. Because we are using the word spirit there in the sense of meaning the underlying principle, the philosophy behind the thing. Right? So it still boils down to a question of doing, but it boils down to a greater depth in what you do. First of all, you should not let your hands carry out the action. But now the way we interpret it, you should not let your mind think the thought. But is this what it means? Well, more and more I am persuaded that this is not what he's meaning at all. The New Testament is in what? The life of Jesus and you brethren who have been studying for 15, 20 years the truth about God. What is the life of Jesus? Say it in a chorus. His Father. I hear Brother Howard saying the Holy Spirit, but I expect. Don't you believe that the Holy Spirit is really the life of Christ in the believer? Is this a principle? Is this a thought? Or is this a, 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 a living element? literally residing in the life of the believer. Which is it? And I'm coming to that passage. So we won't go there yet. Just read, let us read in the same passage that we are at, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's just see what verse 18 says because verse 18 makes it abundantly clear what he's talking about. 
I'm not verse 18, I'm sorry, verse 17. He says, Now the Lord is that Spirit. Chapter 3, isn't that what I said? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We are reading from chapter 3, and I just read verse 6, so I'm going to verse 17 of the same chapter. Sorry. He says, Now the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. It's the same context. It's a continuing in the same context of what he said in verse 6. The Spirit gives life. When you look at verse 17 and he says the Spirit gives life, what is he talking about? Jesus Christ, the Lord, is that Spirit. So there's something here that if you relate to it, it's going to kill you. And that's God's, that was God's purpose in giving this thing. It was supposed to kill you. And there's something here that when you relate to it, it literally gives you life. And I want to say this again and again. Life is not a theory. Life might be something you cannot hold with your hands. You cannot see with your eyes. You cannot define with your mouth. You cannot understand with your mind. But life is real. And if you don't think life is real, let somebody shoot you through the, the brain. You won't know what is gone, but something will be gone. Life is a literal thing. And the life of Christ is a real element that actually invades the believer with his permission, of course. And that is New Testament Christianity. You receive something from out of this planet. Something supernatural comes into you from another planet. The Bible describes it from another place. The Bible describes it in many ways. It describes it as a new birth. It says if any man is in Christ, he's what? A new creation. All things pass away. All things become new. That's not the consequence of human willpower. That's not the consequence of intellectual manipulation. That's a consequence of divinity invading humanity. That is what the New Testament is about. And everybody who believes it and can walk in it will live above the world. Will live above the world because it is impossible that God should live in you and you live like ordinary people. But the point is, we lose focus of it or we don't believe it. Or maybe we never realized it. But this is our religion. Our religion is the religion of the New Testament. We are ministers of the New Testament. Now he says not of the letter. And I need to, 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 to just touch on that to emphasize this point. When somebody speaks about a letter, what images come to your mind? Somebody says the law. Well, in context, I agree. Just talking about the word letter, what comes to my mind is the alphabet, A, B, C, D, right? Or, or writing, writing something to somebody. That's what we call a letter too, right? But what the Bible is really talking about is when, when you look at the verse that follows, verse 7. It becomes clear that in context here he's talking about the commandments. And I want you to read with me so we can be certain that I'm not misleading you on this point. He says, but if the ministration of death, what does he call it? Ministry. The ministry of death, just as we were ministers, we are ministers of life. He says there was something that was a ministry of death. And he said it was written and engraven on stones. And that gives you clearly the indication he's talking about the Ten Commandments. It was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather, or be even more glorious? Now, you can go to Exodus 34, and you will find that when Moses came down from the mountain, with the Ten Commandments in his hand, his face was glowing. And the children of Israel could not look at his face. That's what Paul is saying here. He says when this ministry was instituted, it was so glorious, they could not look at Moses' face. But he says the ministry of the Spirit is even more glorious. Now, I want to make it clear that he's not here saying that the Ten Commandments are not good or that they were abolished. You need to realize that. I want to make that point because I don't want to be accused of heresy. I know that the first time I ever looked at this verse closely was 
some Jehovah's Witnesses cornered me. And I was a young Christian. And I didn't know what to do with the passage because they, they came to the verse where it says, that which is abolished, that which is done away was glorious. And I, I could see that it was talking about the Ten Commandments. And I'm a good Adventist, I'm a Sabbath keeper, I didn't know what, I know the commandments can't be done away with, but the passage seemed to be saying it. And I had to go home beaten. But you know, it was a blessing because when I got home, I got out my Bible and I read the passage again and again and again. And I have to say that that was one of the experiences that first made me begin to understand the place of the law and what the passage is really saying. So it was a blessing. But what he's talking about is the ministry. Ministration, the ministration. There's a ministry that is founded, and, and it's not so much the commandments, but the, the, the commandments were expressive of this kind of ministry. There are two kinds of ministry that exist on the planet, in the universe. There's a ministry of external motivation. If I want David to do something, I can say, David, do X, Y, and Z. Z. Z in Jamaica. Why does he, how, how does he, what does, how does he know how to behave? It's based on what I have said, right? The details of my words define how he's going to behave. And if I am his master, he has no option but to do precisely what I say, no more and no less. It doesn't matter how he feels or what he wants to do, he must do according to what the letter says to him. This is, the, this is the method of a servant or of a slave. This is the service of a, of, a, of a person who is not free to think and who cannot adjust what is said at all. There's another kind of motivation. And the Bible talks about it. In another place it is referred to as the law of the spirit of life. It is what we call intrinsic motivation. It's the kind of thing that happens if Denise finds that her, her baby's life that her baby is being mistreated by somebody. Right? Right, I know her and I can imagine what would happen. Nobody has to tell her, get up and fight. Something springs up inside of her bosom and you can't keep her still. Now you don't need a rule or a regulation or somebody giving you a, a, a set of laws to tell you how to respond in that situation. Your nature dictates how you are going to behave. Now this kind of motivation for behavior is far more effective than simply giving a person instructions. Now in the Old Testament, because of the condition of the Jews, God gave them a system where they were governed by a ministry based on external rules. External rules don't work very well. I like to talk about the seatbelt law because... I mean, it just came in in Jamaica, and I was so upset, right? Because I don't like to wear a seatbelt. And I ride a little bike, and they force me to wear a helmet, which I was riding all my life without a helmet, and my head gets hot and starts to itch. Now I have to wear it. I hate it. I do. So if the police are around, I put on the seatbelt. <laughs> but that's the kind of obedience you get. From the letter of the law, when you are responding to a rule that you don't like, that's the kind of obedience you get. You obey sometimes and sometimes you don't. That's why sometimes you tell lies and sometimes you tell the truth. Because the law says do it. And the law says love your enemies and you try. But sometimes you lose it because it's what you really want to do that comes out when the crisis strikes. So the law never can produce the system or the ministry of law. Never can produce what God wants. That system is good for servants. It's good for an illustrative system like Israel was. It cannot do for the eternal system. It cannot do. You need something that will work. What works is when your nature wants to do the thing because it is what you are. Nobody has to tell me to love my children. Nobody has to tell me when it's time to eat food. Nobody has to tell me there are some things that are inborn into us as human beings. It's our nature and those things flow from us naturally. God, we call this natural law. And the New Testament is God's method of introducing natural law into the experience of his people. 
That's what the New Testament is. To give us a life that has different motivations, different desires. I've heard people say, Man, I want to be a Christian, but how can I give up this? That's not your question. You can't. But when you have life, you will wonder how you ever loved that thing that is so hard to give up. The New Testament is a miracle. It's nothing less. And if you consider it to be anything less, you don't yet know what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Every religion on this planet that is not the truth builds on the principle of external motivation. And the governments do the same. And the law enforcement does the same because they don't know any other way. You can't change people in this planet except from the outside. You send them to prison. You send them to reform schools. You send them to counseling. You send them to Alcoholics Anonymous. You try to change from the outside and so you get a facade of change. But when the crunch comes, the old nature springs up and you find that the person is still there. The only thing in this universe that can bring a clean thing out of an unclean is Christ. The life of Christ in the believer is a new covenant Praise God. And that is what God gives us. So when you hear people comparing Christianity to, to, to Islam, pity them. Or comparing Christianity to Judaism, pity them. They be, the, all those religions are based on morality, moral behavior, moral instruction. Christianity is the only religion that says morality can't help you, words can't help you, the letter can't help you. You need a savior who can give you life. An element from eternity that can transform you. That is what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Would that we might not only understand it, but believe it and walk in that belief. So we are ministers, brothers and sisters, of the New Testament. We are ministers of the New Covenant. That's what God has done for us. And I want you to get this straight. Or let me build on the point a little bit. If I were to ask this question, what is the difference between the Old and the New Testament? What would you say? Christ. The new birth. Christ. The only difference between both Testaments is the life of Christ in the believer. Now, the implications of this are tremendous because if you don't have this life, you're not really a Christian. If your basis of relationship to God is a basis of rules. If that's the foundation, you are not really a Christian. The essential difference between both covenants was the life of Christ in the believer. And over and over, over and over you can read, I'm going to read a few places here. I'm just going to probably just have to rush through them because there are so many of them. But look at, um, look for example at John chapter 7. And I'd like you to follow with me while I read from verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. What was he speaking about? Verse 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given. Because Jesus was not yet glorified. Because that Jesus was not yet glorified. There the Bible tells you clearly. Until Jesus was glorified, until he went back to heaven and was glorified, the Holy Spirit had not yet been given. And until that happened, you could not have had this river of living water flowing from your belly. Now what kind of experience have you ever had that you could describe as a river of water flowing out of your belly? I've heard people cry for their belly, especially in, in Jamaica. The women have a way when somebody dies for them, they hold their belly and say, Oh Lord, my belly, my belly. Because the, the, the belly seems to be an... Ex you, you tend to feel things here and you... you you feel it there when, when, when great emotional trauma takes place. I don't know if that's what Jesus meant. In fact, I sus suspect that he meant more than that. But he meant something is going to happen to you. 
And why from my belly? And why rivers of living water? What kind of experience could he have described in this way? He says, the one who believes on me, you're going to have a river of living water flowing out of your belly. Man. I'd like to take a census today and find out how many people have ever had this river of living water flowing from your belly. But this is New Testament Christianity. It is New Testament Christianity. Look at how, look at how it is expressed in another place. Look at... Or before we come to that, look, look, go to Matthew 11. It's not how it's expressed, but another place which speaks about this experience. Matthew 11... And I want to read from verse 11. It says, Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Well, whatever... Whatever Jesus was talking about, John didn't have it. Did he? Whatever makes those in the kingdom great, John did not have it. Would I, am I, is that a logical conclusion? I only hear David answering. Yes. I want to know that you're with me and you're understanding. Now, he says, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven. And we were here last year. And we shared in some of those thoughts. So I know I'm, I'm, I'm sharing with most of us who already have a background in what I'm trying to get across. That the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is not referring to something that, were, that is yet to happen in the future. Because Jesus, when he was here, said the kingdom of heaven is where? Is within you. And he said the kingdom of heaven is, is at hand. Then he said the kingdom of heaven is within you. And he sent them out to preach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he says, you are to go into all the world and preach the gospel of the kingdom. So the, the kingdom of heaven is something Jesus came and instituted. In fact, it's the same thing as this New Testament that we're talking about. The new covenant. God has not yet established his kingdom on the planet. But he has established the kingdom in his people. And the essence of this kingdom is what? Christ in you. Christ in you. The king lives in you, and wherever the king is, there is an extension of the kingdom. So Jesus says here, among those who are born of women, the greatest up to that point was John the Baptist. But he says, the least in the kingdom is greater than John. And isn't that reasonable? If before the time of Jesus, this manifestation of Jesus Christ was never in any believer, then Everybody who lives in the New Testament age and the New Testament experience must be greater because it is Christ walking the planet again through each one of us. John was his forerunner. You are the vessel that expresses him as, as, as in a way that John never experienced. That is what Jesus was trying to say. And I am amazed as I look at the, Old Test the New Testament and find out how it comes out over and over again. In Jeremiah 31, there is a, a promise that Howard was reading last night. Let's look at it quickly. Jeremiah 31. In verse 31, from verse 31 to 34, it says, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Judah, house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt which my covenant they break although I was an husband unto them said the Lord but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days said the Lord I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, said the Lord. 
for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Now I'd like you to tell me, please, anybody, which church that you know of does this verse apply to? The individual temple. Somebody, anybody else said, was saying something? Notice the description. Notice the description. It says, they shall what? All. Know me. What church did you say this is again where every member knows Jesus? 144,000. So, if this is so, because... To be truthful, some of the Adventist pioneers have concluded that this verse is not yet fulfilled and it won't be fulfilled until the 144,000. But in the book of Hebrews in chapter 8, Paul states that this verse is already fulfilled. So which church? Which church do you know where every member knows Jesus from the least of them to the greatest of them? Brother Lynn. Thank you. That's the best answer you could have when you talk about it's a Christian church, right? And that the church, the, the church of the firstborn. Now, this passage is talking about the new covenant, but it is also talking about something else. This is one of the passages in the Bible that defines the church more clearly than any other. Anybody in here who does not know the Lord is not a member of this church. You could all be sent the Adventists. You could all be believers in the Godhead. If you don't know the Lord, you are not a member of this church. The New Testament church is exclusively made up of converted people. And the nature of that conversion is that you possess the life of Christ. Every member of that church knows the Lord. This is one of the verses that defines the church very clearly. So, so, our Adventist pioneers, because they believe so strongly that the SDA organization is a church, they concluded that this verse, this verse will not be fulfilled until the last moments of time when supposedly the Adventist denomination is going to get cleaned up on everybody and there's going to be, you know. But from the time that Jesus established his church on earth, this new covenant was established. And God has had a church where every member knows him. And that is why you cannot define the church of God by human parameters. You can't say it is this denomination or that one or this group or the other because that is not, that is, that is defining the church by Old Testament standards. In the Old Testament, God had a people that were called his people. In actual fact, they were not his people, not in the true sense. They were only representational of the true church that was to come. But those Jews were not God's people because the word of God says, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, what? He is none of his. How many of those people had the Spirit of God? Well, a few maybe, right? The majority of them fell like flies in the wilderness because they didn't know God at all. Yet they were called God's people because God was working with a system, an illustration. And they were called God's people because what? Because they had the skin color, because they were circumcised in the flesh, because their mothers and fathers were Jews. They were called God's people. It was symbolic. It was representational. But in the true system, you don't need Jewish life in you. You need the life of the Son of God. That was representational. The true Israel is made up only of converted people. So that is why one of the, 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 the things you can understand why you cannot define God's people anymore by those limitations that once defined physical Israel. Because God is not dealing with people on that basis anymore. This is the new covenant. And every time I hear, I hear some group say, this denomination is God's church. And it's not just Adventists who do that, right? Jehovah's Witnesses do it. Mormons do it. Reformed Adventists do it. Shepherds Rod do it. Every time I hear them saying this, I understand these are Old Testament believers. They don't know or understand what the New Testament is about. They try to build on the same principle and they admire Israel just like the Jews do, just like the Muslims do. They build on the same principle of human organization, of human cohesiveness based on human principles. And they think 
This is God's way because it looks good externally. But God's church is made up of those who have the life of Christ in them. And those are the only people God has on this planet. And they are the only ones who are going to be saved. So, when God says, I'll make a new covenant, He says, I will write my laws in their hearts and in their minds. And again, you know, our superficiality makes us think, okay, before this I used to read the Ten Commandments, now I'm going to memorize them. And we think that this is how it is written on your hearts and your minds. Well, look here. Does it mean that the people in the Old Testament didn't have any memories? They couldn't memorize it? Maybe that's why they wrote them on their foreheads and on their hands and made phylacteries because they had no memory? Does God simply mean when He says, I will write it on your hearts and in your minds, He's going to help us to memorize those laws? No, obviously. He, he's, he's using words that we need to understand correctly. What He's saying he doesn't say it in the way that we would, use, we would say it in 20th century terminology. I'm going to infuse a new life into you that will naturally produce this kind of behavior. He doesn't say it. But that's what he means. Look at what, um, look at what Paul says in Galatians 5 and verse 22. He says, I'm going to, to read just a few verses. I'll skip from one to the other. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 18, he says, But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. And when he says under the law here, he means you are not under the government. You are not under the ministry of the law. You are not controlled by external Rules. That's not the basis of your behavior. If you've been led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Why is that so? Then he goes on to say in verse 22, Because the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Then he says, Against such there is no law. And what on earth does that mean? Well, notice what he says. He says, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You don't need the government of the law to produce this kind of behavior because the Spirit naturally bears fruit. And that fruit is perfectly in harmony with what the law was trying to demand, right? The law was trying to compel you to do certain things. But now that the Spirit is in you, those things appear in your life naturally. It bears, the, your life bears fruit. So, you don't need to be under the government of the law in order to be what God wants you to be. That's what it is saying. But notice it says, it says um, at the end of that verse, against such there is no law. And this is kind of incidental to what we're saying, but I don't want to leave it out because it's an important thing to understand. Against such there is no law. Would one person just like to give me a comment on what you think that verse that, 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 that is saying? Against such there is no law. Something like that. All right, a little bit more. I'll take, I'll take rather Bill, and then I'll share my thought on it. Yes. Yes. Thank you. He said, he said what I have in mind, but I want to, to expand on it so we get it clear. What's the purpose of a law? Somebody's using the word I'm looking for. No. Somebody used the word very loudly. Thank you. The purpose of a law is to restrain behavior. You could say that every law limits your freedom in a way. What kind of law? Boy, don't, jump, don't climb that tree. Don't jump from the roof. You go, you're driving along the road and you see a red sign and it says, Stop. It limits your behavior. It prevents you from going through, right? All laws are intended to restrain behavior. That's what Paul is dealing with. Laws limit your behavior. 
Now, when you view Allah as a limitation, it becomes, in many cases, oppressive, restrictive. Now, Paul is saying, what law is there that says, stop being, stop, stop loving? What law do you know that says you mustn't love? You're loving too much. You don't have any such law? Do you have any law that says you mustn't be so happy? Although I suppose in today's age, if you're too happy, they might carry you off to the madhouse, right? But the love, joy, peace, long-suffering, which law do you know of that restrains that kind of behavior? God has no such law. So Paul is saying, when you are under the law of the spirit of life and everything is... These fruits are being born. Nothing restrains your behavior. Because your behavior naturally is to do these things and do them in abundance and keep on doing them. You never want to do anything else. So there's nothing. There's no law against the life that you now possess. So you are no longer under any kind of law except the law of the spirit of life. I mean, this is what the New Testament is about. It is about... It is about giving us the liberty to, to be what we want to be because all that we want to be is what God is. By nature, He has given us a new life. This is a new covenant. And this is what we are supposed to be going around and telling the world. Good news, we are ministers of this new covenant. We are not only to be telling the world, but I'm telling you when I read the Bible, I believe we are supposed to be actually passing on this life to others. We have been given that privilege. And I'll just touch on this a little bit because I don't want to cause any more of the... Um, disorientation that maybe some people experienced last year. But I'm telling you, you know in the Bible, when a child was born, the father had the right to do something. He had the right to pass on a blessing. It was the father that the birthright came from, right? And the father would put his hand on the head of his son and, and pass on the blessing and the birthright. You make a guess and, and tell me what you think that means. When you become spiritual fathers of people, the, 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 the symbolism of the Old Testament is carried over into the New Testament. But with deeper reality. And when those disciples went around and laid hands on people and prayed for them, they were passing on the birthright. What is your birthright as a Christian? What is your birthright? What is your right as a born person? It is life. And in this case, it is a life of God. It is a Holy Spirit that is your birthright. If you are a Christian... Your birthright is the Holy Spirit. You are supposed to have this birthright. And your spiritual fathers are the ones through whom God will work to impart this blessing. Anyway, I won't say too much more on that. I couldn't resist it. But, but, we are ministers of the Spirit. We are ministers of the Spirit. And I want God to help us to recognize that. If everybody here today can recognize that and step out in the reality of that truth, we can do something similar to what happened at Pentecost. Because all that happened on Pentecost was that they came to believe the truth. They believed it with all their hearts. And they went out of that place believing the truth. And when you believe something, you will live it. You don't try to live it. You don't need to be coerced or persuaded to, to, to live it. When you believe it, you live it because you know it is so. You look at yourself as somebody different because you recognize that once I was this person, I had this 9 to 5, I had to go through the grind of existence, hoping and praying for, for a better day. That day has arrived. And you know it. So you live it. You saw them in, in, in the New Testament. You saw how they were transformed when they believed it. When they believed it, you saw the cowardly Peter transformed into this, this, like somebody who had no fear. They couldn't shut him up. They couldn't beat him until he was quiet. They couldn't persuade him that it was expedient to, 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 to be quiet for a while. No. Locked him up and told him, don't speak again in this name. The next morning, they found them speaking in the exact same spot where they arrested them the evening before. Can you imagine they come and shut down your home church? With their black, black, the ATF or the BATF with their black helicopters or whatever it is. And they come and they shut down your home church and they threaten you and they whatever. And lock up who is to be locked up. And the next night, you're back there. And you're keeping your meeting. I mean, I, 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 I know the, the, the situation here is fearsome. 
When I come through immigration, I'm on my P's and Q's. Because they are just looking for an excuse to tell you go into that room. And it's very disconcerting when that happened. Happened to me a couple of times on to Howard. And luckily we came off unscathed. But blessed, yeah, by the grace of God. Thank you for the correction. But it's 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 intimidating. Man but when you know that you're on a mission of the king and you are his representative and his life is your life, when you know this, what power on this planet can restrain you? Amen. And brothers and sisters, it is the truth. It is the truth. The problem is that we have not recognized the truth because we have not fed on it enough, right? We have been involved in a whole lot of arguments and debates about all kinds of things. But the most important thing in Christian experience has not been focused on enough. And that is a fact. And we, be, we are changed by beholding. Feed on any subject at all. And it's going to fill your horizon and take over your life. God help us to feed on this truth that Jesus truly is the life of his people. He lives in me. He lives in me. His life is my life. And this is true for every one of us who is a true Christian. God says, all my people shall know me from the least to the greatest. Let's look at another promise here in John chapter 14. And we know this one very well. But, you know, reading through these promises again, I came to recognize that we often misunderstand and misinterpret them. Now you are one of the disciples and you are sitting there this night just before Jesus is crucified. And in verse 14, Jesus says, Jesus says, If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Sister Janet. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you. How long? Well, that promise wasn't just for the twelve, was it? Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he lives with you, and he is going to be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. But look what he says now. Yet a little while... And the world sees me no more. I'm kind of paraphrasing a little to, to, to bring it down a little closer to our time. Let yet a little while and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. At that day, when this happens, you will know that I am in my Father. And you in me. And I in you. When did this happen? Yes. I was wanting to hear everybody give me a chorus. But uh, they're reluctant to speak. So, so, I want to make the point that in John 14 here, Jesus was referring to Pentecost. Now, all of us believe that when Jesus says, I will send another comforter, we believe the promise applies to us. I'm going to send another comforter, he says, that he may dwell with you forever. If you don't believe that this promise is for you, then why are you even here? Why are you even calling yourself a Christian? All Christians believe the comforter is for us. And he says, when the comforter comes, at that day you're going to know something. You're going to know that I am in you, and you in me, and my Father in you, right? Now, so, so Brother David says that this was referring to the day of Pentecost. And I agree with him. Jesus says, at that day, when the comforter comes, at that day, you are going to know something. So the comforter he was talking about was not yet with them. Were they then Christians? Yes. Were they then converted? Some of them probably were. Some of them maybe weren't. But definitely after, after Jesus was crucified, they were converted. Conversion is not the same as the gift of the Holy Spirit. So if you think that because you are converted, you necessarily have the gift of the Holy Spirit, I don't think that is biblically correct. The disciples were converted when they were in the upper room. They were converted people. 
But they did not have the comforter. They did not have the gift. It was not yet given. They did not yet have the rivers of living water flowing out of their belly. So I think the point I wanted to make most of all this morning is that many of us think that because we are Christians and we are converted, we have everything. Biblically, that is not correct. Pentecost was something different. Pentecost came to people who were already converted. It was the baptism to bring them. I, 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 I'm hesitating to say that this is a New Testament experience. But I believe it was. I'm going to say it. Before Pentecost, the disciples were in the same condition as Old Testament believers. There are Old Testament believers who are going to be saved, like John the Baptist. But they were not in the kingdom. They never had the kingdom experience. And most Christians that I know are in the Old Testament experience. They are converted, but they don't. They are not in the kingdom. They don't have the rivers of living water flowing out of their belly. But the thing that strikes me is that this was not supposed to be limited. It was supposed to be for every believer. It was supposed to take us into the kingdom experience that the world could not contain. What was going to happen? Today Christianity is being squeezed into a corner by atheism, by Islam, by secularism, by just the grind of the nine to five. We are being crushed into a corner and our life is dying and we have no relevance anymore. Man, you could never imagine that that would have happened when you saw what happened to that early church. But let's just read the promise. Let's just read the promise in Acts chapter 2. I just want us to, to, us to be... Yes, Sister Jen. No. But you can be converted without the baptism of the Spirit. And I believe that the new covenant experience is really the baptism of the Spirit. That's what Jesus says, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This is what he was talking about. Because you recognize that in the Old Testament that everybody who was ever converted, you have to have the Holy Spirit, right? You cannot be converted and not have the influence of the Holy Spirit in your life. But there was something more that came with the New Covenant. Something more. Human beings became citizens of heaven. Human beings became extensions of the life of Christ. And look here. Christ says... All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. We are members of his body. And the body is entitled to every benefit that the head is entitled to. The word of God says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? It says, In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And what? You are complete in him. He ascended on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some teachers, some evangelists, and it goes through the list. We have everybody who is in Christ partakes of the life of Christ. That's what the new covenant is about. And that is why this whatever he is, we are. I mean I've kind of I've kind of toned down a bit on talking about this. I have. And you know I have, because, because not everybody can relate to it. Not everybody can relate to things that they're unfamiliar with. And maybe because of that reason we have toned down a little bit. But look here. Isn't it true that there is a God? Isn't it true that this God is almighty? Isn't it true that we are his children? What is that? Just, just words? Those are just words. I mean, I mean, you look around us and we see we are bound by the same obligations as the per people in the world, right? You go to the same 9 to 5 job, you go to the same doctors, you buy the same insurance. The only thing different, maybe you eat veggie food and they eat something else, right? And then Sabbath you go to church. Right. But you're bound by the same obligations. Your life is squeezed into the same mold as a world is squeezing everybody else. And the tragedy is that our leaders tell us that any attempt to change the situation is dangerous. 
It doesn't matter whether it's the mother church or the aunt church, the reformed church, Adventist church or whatever. Everybody is scared of anything that breaks the pattern that we have been accustomed to for a hundred and how much years. Right? Somehow, some, some, some mania, some, some, something has taken hold of the minds of the people that they think, if you keep on repeating the same thing over and over and over long enough, I mean, every meeting I go to, for years I hear them talk about, we must do this and do this and do this. We must reform, we must change, we must work a little harder, we must try... Man! Don't you try? Haven't you tried? Haven't you heard it? Haven't you, haven't you felt like me? A growing concern that I'm growing older and my hairs are getting gray and, and falling out. And for 35 years, I've been hearing and listening and making the same effort and nothing. Doesn't it make you conclude that maybe, just maybe, we've been approaching things the wrong way? The time has come for the children, for the child to be born. And there's no strength to bring forth. But you know, Paul says in Romans chapter 12, Be not conformed to this world. One translation I love says, Don't allow the world to squeeze you into its mold. Don't you know that, what that means? Right? Satan puts you all in a package and he starts to put on the pressure. And you have to bend and take the shape of that mold. And we have, been, we have been bent into that mold. You can't, you can't do anything because the system has you crushed into its way. Man, you can't even go on the street and hand out a truck. In this, you can't even go and talk. You can't even knock on doors and give a Bible study. Some places it's illegal, right? And you have to go by the laws. The world has so squeezed the life out of us. We need brothers and sisters. We need. We need the experience that they had at Pentecost. We need the life of Christ fully manifested in each one of us. Then jail can't hold you. Jobs can't hold you. Public opinion can't hold you. Nothing can stop you when you know that it is Jesus who is living through you. Disease and sickness can't hold you. Oh, God, help us, brothers and sisters, to believe what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. It is the truth. And Jesus says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But until you know the truth, until you know the truth, you're going to remain enslaved. Because we walk by faith and not by sight. When you know the truth, you believe the truth, you are free. Because we have already been set free. But it is just that we either have not known it or we have not believed it. And if we neither know nor believe it after today, I hope somebody will keep on preaching it and pounding it into our heads until we believe it. Man, I'm amazed because from, Pente from, from the time that Jesus was here, this was our message, the good news of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. This was our message, the new covenant. This was our message, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we have been distracted all about the place. This is a message for the world. It's the message to break people free from the bondage of false religion that teaches people. Do, 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 do. And if you do hard enough. And like I said, you do all the things that you ought to do. And don't do all the things that you ought not to do. Then you possibly might make it into God's favor. Every false religion builds on that principle. Every false religion. And Christianity has adopted it. A religion of morality, moral behavior. I've heard Christians debate with, with Muslims and all they get down to is they're talking about which set of rules is better than which set. Man, that so misses the point. That so misses the issue. One brother in Jamaica said, after we have been talking about this, he says, the Muslims say there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. He says, our message really ought to be, there is no God but Jehovah, and Jesus Christ is his son. 
And that's the message we ought to take to the world. Jesus Christ is the Son of God with all that that implies. With all that that means to us. The world needs to hear it and needs to understand what it means. I have a whole lot more verses that I want to read. But probably I'm just going to read a couple more and then I'm going to stop. Yes, a couple is two. Right. In Jamaica, it can mean half a dozen. <laughs> that's right, Cash. Is that right? Yep, that's a Jamaican. He can tell you. It can mean anything more than one. <laughs> so when somebody comes to your home and says, can I have a couple of mangoes, be careful what you say. Um... Yes, Hebrews. I want to go to the book of Hebrews. Now, in Hebrews 11, in Hebrews 11, and I want to thank um, Brother Howard for kind of pointing, out, pointing this out to me. And last night I heard Brother Linford say the same thing, which, is, which I found very interesting. But in the book of Hebrews, Paul talks about the great men of faith, right? By faith they did this in Hebrews 11. By faith Enoch, by faith Noah, by faith Abraham, by faith Moses, by faith Rahab, by faith Samson. And he goes through all the great people of faith. And look at what he says round at the end. In verse 39. And these all having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Well, what promise? Well, I used to think that it meant the promise that one day he's going to inherit the whole world. But in context, that's not what he's talking about at all. God made a promise to Abraham. And all these great men passed through and they did not receive the promise. The last verse says, God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. Now go to Galatians chapter 3 and we'll see what this promise was that these men never received. To help us to get a better understanding of what it is that we have. It says in verse 16, Galatians 3. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, unto thy seed which is Christ. Then in verse 18. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. So, it's an inheritance he's talking about. And he says, if this is, you have two ways that you can approach it. It can be by law, or it can be by promise. Right? Now he says, if the inheritance is of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it by promise. This is the way you obtain the inheritance, through the promise of God. Right? Now, what is this promise? Look at verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. The promise has to do with Jesus Christ. And what essentially about Jesus Christ? Let me say this to you before I read the next verse. Jesus lived 2,000 years ago. Died on a cross. You go to the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you read of the great works he did. You read of his moral principles. How can that mean anything to you? By what means does that become relevant to you? I'm kind of being a little vague in my question because I don't want to give it to you on a platter. By what means? I mean, the, the, the story of Jesus is a nice story. The Bible is a history book. You go there and you read it. 
By what means does this become relevant to you? Through the Holy Spirit. The, Jesus is alive today. Everything you read in the Bible is, is alive today. Every principle, every teaching that you read in the life of Christ is infused into you today only if you possess the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, the life of Jesus is a nice history book. That's all. Without the Holy Spirit, it's just a nice history story. Without the Holy Spirit, we have nothing but a story. And that is what has happened to many Christians. They are living in the letter, the words, and they don't know the life. And like I said last year, they are afraid of it because the Pentecostals have taken it to a level where it has become some kind of extreme kind of uncouth behavior. But you don't need to be scared of the truth because Satan tries to stir it up. Because God is still God and truth is still truth. The only way that Christianity is relevant to Jesus today in practical terms is the Holy Spirit. Even in heaven, you have no contact, no interaction with him, but by the Holy Spirit. His life flows. If you want to visualize it, his life flows across the expanse of infinity and comes and flows into your body. You have personal living contact with the living God through his son Jesus Christ. Personally and in a real way, you have a supernatural element in you. And some people don't like me to say it, but where is it? It's in your body. Somewhere in your body exists an element from outside of this planet. And if it doesn't exist there, you're not even a Christian. And that is awesome. That's amazing. That's amazing. It's a good thing to remember when you're feeling sick and you need prayer. It's a good thing to remember when you need inspiration. When you're feeling lonely or afraid. It's a good thing to remember. I am more than somebody from this planet. So, I'll read probably the last verse. Yes, Brother David. I have four minutes. Whoa. Verse 14. Verse 14. Galatians 3. Let me read verse 13 so we can get the setting. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive, what? The promise of the Spirit through faith. This is the blessing of Abraham. When God promised to bless all nations through Abraham's seed, He blessed us in Jesus Christ, yeah, he died on the cross 2,000 years ago. That blessing is not yours unless he's living in you today. 2,000 years ago, Jesus dying on the cross is a nice story. How does the blessing become yours? You think it is through your theorizing about that fact? Or through you feeling sentimental because they show pictures of this bleeding man on the cross? It becomes your blessing when that same seed of Abraham living today ministers the new covenant to you by imparting his life to you. That is the blessing. That's a promise that these men died not having received. It came upon us in that seed 2,000 years ago. And it exists and is real today. And you and I, when we experience this, we also become ministers of the new covenant. Praise God. God help us never to forget it. And not only not to forget it, but to never rest or to be at ease until we experience the fullness of what this means. God help you and God help me. God bless you. Let us pray. Father, you know sometimes I just don't have the words to express how I appreciate you. I thank you, Father. I thank you because I believe that this morning you, you, you have been here with us. 
and you have expressed in your word things that are vital for us to understand. Thank you, my Father. You see, my brothers and sisters, oh God, my Father, I pray that you take these truths and so imprint it on the hearts of each one of us that they might never be erased, Lord. I pray that this experience of the New Testament of which our Jesus is the mediator might become the experience of every one of us. This is my prayer. And I thank you for hearing and for answering. In his precious name, amen.